Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Don coming with you, or coming to you rather, with another live episode of Franklin Outside. Yet again, unfortunately, we've had to turn things inside out. So we're Franklin inside uh, today, unfortunately, due to some inclement weather. So we're going to keep today's episode nice and short and sweet. And it's going to build off of the episode that we offered last week. If you tuned in last week, or if you missed it, don't worry, check out the Franklin Institute's Facebook page in our video link. They're all archived in there. And what we talked about last week was using our phone both as a microscope and as a binocular set to help us when we're out on our nature scavenger hunts. So for today, I thought we'd try and revisit some of those concepts. And again, keeping it somewhat short and sweet, seeing if we can play a little bit of back and forth here to see if you folks can tell what it is that I'm looking at using the microscope setting. So before we get into that, let's revisit how we used our phone as both a binocular set and as a microscope. Remember, it was using lenses, specifically convex lenses. And we've what we've done to, um, to zoom in far away to use our phone as a binocular, to zoom in and take that really, really close up photo is to actually put our phone up to the binocular set. And you'll remember we had some trouble with that uh, when we were live last week. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've done a little scavenger hunting on my own to offer up these photos for you. So I'm gonna pull up my phone and you can see me in two different cameras. Hello world, hello world. And what I'm gonna do is share some photos that I took on a nature scavenger hunt this past week using my phone and then using that binocular trick. Remember if I wanted to zoom in closely, I held up my phone right to the eyepiece of a binocular. So it's getting a little bit dizzy here with the two cameras, so stick with us. What I'll do is I'll share a photo. So I'm just gonna pull that photo up right now on my cell phone. There we go. And I can see that now and hopefully uh, you can as well. Now, um, what you're looking at in that photo is just a beautiful tree in the distance, right? I'm about 100 feet away from that tree and I tried to zoom in uh, to see a woodpecker that I could hear. Remember, I use all of my observational skills, not just my eyes, uh, but also what I can hear when I'm out in the woods and I wanted to snap a photo of it. In the dead center of that photo at that bare branch area is where the woodpecker was and I could hear him, but I couldn't see him. So I had to use this binocular trick to zoom in to see him. So there's as close as I could get using my phone. Now we're gonna switch. I'm hearing that we're not seeing any photo. Well, that is unfortunate. Let's try one last time. New technologies, as always, we're making it work here on Franklin Outside. Oh, it looks like there was a bit of a delay, um, but then it came up. So hopefully you folks at home can see this tree that's off in the distance. Perhaps there was a little bit of a delay there. I can see it here. Hopefully you can as well. So now, like I said, I'm going to switch to that other photo view, what it looked like through the binoculars. So I'm going to stop that share again. I'm going to pick this second photo to share with you now. Okay, and while that's loading up, it sounds like you folks at home might have a little bit of a delay, uh, but what you will see in just a moment is a beautiful woodpecker that's again at that top of that uh, tip top tree. It says, says that you're seeing that photo there. Excellent, I'm not lying to you, I swear, pinky promise. <laughs> we did find this woodpecker and you can see the beautiful plumage there with the uh, red hair, the long, 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 long beak there. Of course, it's nice and strong. It's helpful to poke into the outer hard layer of bark on that tree. And this is using the same phone to take photos. Remember, initially I was just using my phone. I could only see um, very, very little detail of the top of the tree, but here I've held it up to my binoculars and I've been able to take a, a pretty detailed shot. So I'm really pleased um, about that. And I hope that you folks try that out as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop sharing that and stop that video there. Great. Now we're going to revisit the other way that we said we could use our phones and that's as a microscope. So if you remember, we used a very teeny tiny lens, remember that convex lens that I took from a, a little laser pointer. And these are common little household items you can find at the pet store, at CVS, we use them for the, the dogs here at home. Um, many of you cat owners will be quite familiar uh, with the laser pointer. You can pop the laser pointer out from the very, very 
uh, you can pop the lens, excuse me, of the laser pointer out and use it to help use your phone as a microscope. So what I've done essentially is build myself a microscope. So I had to get creative here. Remember, unfortunately, we can't go to work just like you folks at home, but we do have some materials lying around and I happen to consider myself a little bit handy. So I've, I've actually built myself a, a microscope here. So, so let's walk through whatever the heck I'm looking at. So I have myself a little extra piece of shelf downstairs and I cut into a small rectangular piece here and I've threaded some bolts through it. And on top of those bolts, I've cut some plexiglass pieces. So it looks like a, a pretty, um, a pretty impressive little homemade microscope stand, doesn't it? We can provide the link to this. I don't suspect that most of you folks at home will want to go to the nerdy lengths that I went to for this, though you may, and we're happy to provide that resource. So there's just two things that I want to point out on my homemade microscope before we actually start using it. The first thing is this little tiny spot right here, and I'm going to zoom in on that using my phone in the other camera view in just a moment. I've actually inserted that laser pointer lens inside of a small hole there. So that's what we're using to zoom in on the sample. And the sample will be sitting on this lower piece of plexiglass here. I can adjust that using a fun little wing nut here. So I can move what's called the stage uh, up and down. So that's to help focus in on what it is that I'll be looking at. You may have also noticed that on the base there, there's a small hole drilled. What I'm going to do is use a little flashlight on the base facing upwards through my sample to help illuminate what it is that we're looking at. So let's pop that guy on. I'm going to place that inside the microscope stand. And we're going to start looking at some uh, pretty cool samples. Now, the first one I would love to talk with you about, and then I've got four other samples. And I don't want to reveal what they are too, too quickly. And as I'm loading this sample in, it looks like we have a question. Does it matter which way the lens is? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much for sharing it. It does indeed matter which way the lens is placed. Now, Remember I said that the lens was convex. So actually, if we rotate around the lens, it doesn't change whether or not it's convex. A convex lens simply has to do with how the, the shape of the lens is. So they're actually wider at the center than they are at the edges. And the opposite is true then for a concave lens. But what does matter is the way light travels through that lens. Now, if light is traveling through a lens that's shaped this way, when light incident radiation, it's called, when light rays hit that lens, they actually bend towards the center of it. Okay, so let's imagine we have parallel light waves coming in, they hit our lens that's shaped sort of like a like a cupped hand here, like a like a C, and they bend inwards towards the middle. Now the opposite is true where my lens, well, I'll have to switch hands, I suppose, <laughs> where my lens um, shaped the other way. I guess I can't bend my hand the opposite way, can I? But let's imagine then if in that same lens, if light is entering from this side, light rays actually get bent in the opposite direction. So what that ultimately means is it will affect our viewpoint, how we are seeing the image that's on the other side of the lens. So yes, using a convex lens, once I pop it into the stage of the microscope, I want to ensure that the convex portion or the portion that's bent outwards, or to go back to this shape here, that's bent outwards is facing my sample. Okie dokie. We already have um, does it matter which way the lens is pointed? So yes, so we clarified that that was the case. And indeed, the, last, the final point there is when you're pulling that lens out of the little cat toy, the laser pointer, you will notice that it's already um, facing outwards. So the light source is behind the lens here. And remember, it travels towards the lens, gets bent uh, inwards. Okay, fantastic. Lots of talk about lenses. I love it. So just adjust my audio cable here. Very good. So now we're gonna use my second camera that I've got handy and you're gonna get a first person view or a first camera view really of what the microscope looks like when it's being used in action. So let's turn this second video on again. There it is. And I'm gonna get up from one video and head to the other and let's switch around. You folks don't wanna see my face. You wanna see our microscope, don't you? 
There we go. Okay, so here's the whole stand. You'll see I've got a little notepad in the background there and I've got um, a sample already loaded up here. You can tell that it's a leaf. So let's focus in. Now I'm going to lower it down. And now I have to look at my camera to, low, to layer this up. So it's gonna be a little bit tricky, so bear with me. Okay, I'm hovering just above the stand of the microscope and you can see that little lens in there, can't you? So I'm just gonna drop down my lens right on top there. Gorgeous, okay. All righty, now before we go any further, we can already see um, this sample. Now you saw beforehand that it was a leaf um, and we saw this sample indeed last week when we were testing out our microscope lens. What we're looking at there, we can't zoom in just yet, but we will in a moment. Uh, what we're looking at there are leaf veins. And if we could get even further in, we'd see individual cells. Now my camera is not strong enough to do that, but if you have um, a really professional grade camera phone, you might actually be able to see individual cells. So Bear with me again while we try and zoom in here. Um, let's go to our screen share. Share. There we go. Are we zooming in on your camera? Yes, we are fantastic. We made our technology work. That is very satisfying. <laughs> For those of you, of course, working from home, you know that we take the little wins, don't we? Okay, so we are able to zoom in really, really nicely there to see some more detail, but it still looks a little bit fuzzy, doesn't it? So just as you would with a typical microscope, we can adjust that stand, that lower level that my sample's actually sitting on. So I'm going to adjust that now and see if we can't bring it into more better focus. So I'm adjusting those wing nuts on the edges. It looks like we're getting closer, doesn't it? Ooh, 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 ooh. Gorgeous. Oh, I hope you folks are as enjoying this as much as I am. Really, really stunning leaf architecture. Okay, I'm so glad that we really got this to work out. You can see up close and personal the outermost layer of that leaf. So we won't go down the rabbit hole of talking about leaf structure, um, but if you're interested, certainly drop a question down into the comments. We can talk about what we're seeing. Now, there are different ways for you to prepare leaf to actually see it, but the most important thing that I wanna point out is that we have that light source beneath. I'm gonna take that uh, little flashlight out that you saw initially and watch what happens to my sample. It's kind of dark, doesn't it? Now all of a sudden I'm relying on any kind of reflected light um, that's coming off of my notebook that's sitting around um, or bouncing off of my desk. So I can't really see very well. But once I put that light back in, I can see those cells much better. All righty, really gorgeous there. Oh, I'm so pleased I could look at this all afternoon. Okay, now again, if we were able to zoom in even further, we'd notice that we could see a feature called stomata. And that's actually where leaves open and close little tiny holes on the edges of their leaves to help bring in CO2, so that's carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, or to let out water if it needs to. And sometimes you can see leaves that look like they're dripping even when it's a dry day, it's because water's actually escaping. So those veins there uh, provide space for the phloem and the xylem, and these are simply uh, structures that allow the uh, tree and the leaves to move around nutrients and water throughout the tree. Okay, really gorgeous. I could look at this all afternoon, but don't worry. I promised you a nice short and sweet video. So now instead of giving away what it is that we're looking at, I'd like you folks to help me figure it out moving forward. So I'm pulling out that sample there and apologies if you hear a hammer in the background. My neighbor's doing some home improvements. Maybe they'll come by and help me out with uh, my, my bathroom needs a renovation if they want to come by. Okay, let's start with this one. All right, now remember, I'm not gonna tell you what we're about to look at. So go ahead and, and drop in the comments what you think we might be looking at. All right, I'm lining up my next slide. And you'll notice that if you do start playing with a little home microscope like this, kind of tricky to line it up. It does take a little bit of practice. There we go. Oh, very nice. Okay, 
And I'll leave that right there. Now this one kind of looks icky now that I see it on the screen. It almost looks, it's kind of pinkish, kind of red. I see some black dots in there. Go ahead and leave in the comments, what else are you observing? What else are you noticing about the image that we're looking at? It's so, so gorgeous and magical. I'm so pleased again that we can, we can see down so, so tiny um, into this uh, little sliver here. Now, without giving away what it is, I will say it is something um, that you can eat. Um, it is a favorite summer treat. Um, I've been trying to grow these actually at home and we've been having some cool weather, surprisingly cool weather. So I've been having a little bit of a trick there. Um, I'll give you another clue and it's that this particular um, sample is a fruit. So somebody says they think it's a watermelon. It's not a watermelon, but that's an excellent guess. Why do we think it's a watermelon? I think maybe because it, it looks pink, certainly, and it looks maybe it's got some black spots in there. So somebody else says they think it's a melon as well. And yeah, it certainly looks like a melon, doesn't it? But now that we know it's a fruit and we know it's not a melon, um, maybe I'll give you another clue. Someone else says it's a well-toasted cracker. It is not a well-toasted cracker. But again, we're all picking up on these little tiny black dots here. And I think that you folks could tell me that those are seeds. Yes, they are indeed seeds. Very good observation. And this particular fruit has its seeds on its outside. That should be a dead giveaway for you. We know that we're talking about a fruit. We know that it's red. It looks kind of meaty, doesn't it? Maybe it's a favorite summer treat, for me at least. Um, and it's got its seeds on the outside. In fact, it can have upwards of over 100 seeds on its outside. And I'll just wait a few more moments to see if anybody comes through with the correct identification of our specimen here. And I'll take a moment while those answers are being submitted um, to mention that this image and others will be available on our Instagram page. So we're going to try and do this kind of guessing game using this homemade microscope uh, with everyone at home. And indeed, somebody has identified a strawberry. Congratulations. Yes, we have several answers rolling in now. Yes, indeed, we are looking at a strawberry. Alrighty, now this strawberry slice, I actually had to very, very thinly pull off the outermost edge of the strawberry fruit so that it was translucent enough to allow the light through. When I was experimenting with this initially, I noticed that not enough light was getting through and I couldn't see that seed detail. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So that is to say that if you're experimenting with your microscope at home and you're using a light source beneath your sample, make sure it's nice and thin so the light can actually pass through. So before we swap that off, just move it around a little bit more. I just think that's so fantastic. And there's the edge of that strawberry slice. Okay, I could be here all afternoon, but again, I promised you short and sweet. Sweet, <laughs> get it for our strawberry? Okay, enough of that, Rachel. Let's try something else. All righty, something very, very different, isn't it? All right, once again, I'm gonna adjust my stand here so we can try and zoom in as clearly as possible. So whatever it is that the heck that we're looking at. Okay, let's try that there. There we go. So lining up on the microscope is a very, fine art. And I'll let you folks think about what we're looking at while I answer another question. Uh, we've asked, how did you get such a thin slice? Well, that regarding our previous sample, of course, the strawberry. Super simple answer. I very carefully ran a sharp knife. It has to be a relatively sharp knife, so you're going to want to make sure that we have some adult supervision available for this. But I ran a sharp knife along the outside of the strawberry to just get the thinnest of paper thin slices uh, to be able to get that light um, to shine through. So excellent question. Uh, easy answer. It's a simple, uh, safe cut. Okie dokie. So I've spent some time chatting um, with that uh, guest. And while I've been chatting, what have you been looking at here? 
Um, what do you think that we're looking at? Somebody has guessed a feather. I want to know why you think it's a feather. Tell me, tell me why you think it's a feather in the comments. And before we take the final answer, we'll just move our sample around a little bit. It looks a little bit clumped here. Let's get a different view. Oh, here's a fascinating view. Ooh, 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 beautiful, beautiful. Oh, the world is beautiful. Let's adjust again. Okay. Another shot there. So that's really, really stunning. This, this shot almost looks a little bit like a leaf to me. Um, but I'll give you, again, just a few seconds uh, to drop your final answers into the comment section. So what you think we're looking at. Um, and remind you again, we'll have these and other photos up on our Instagram to help play a little bit of guessing game back and forth. So very good. Nice. Yes, we have we have come into um, nice focus there. And indeed, some of those initial guesses about this being a feather are correct. Now, this is actually a special type of feather. This is a feather that was shed from a baby bird um, earlier this spring. Um, so I collected this off of the ground. I didn't, didn't pluck it off of any uh, unwilling specimen. No worries there. I collected this completely willingly. Of course, as baby birds after they're born, they're actually born with a lighter and a different feather than those that they grow as they become adults. And those special, very light, dandery feathers are extra extra thin, extra wispy almost. And it helps fluff up against the dry body of the bird to help keep the bird warm. So for little tiny birds that don't have much body mass yet, they don't have much fat on their bones just yet, uh, these uh, extra wispy feathers can help keep them warm. Um, it looks like we have another guest. Someone else said an asparagus fern. Um, it almost looks like an asparagus fern, doesn't it? It sort of has that central stalk there with um, perhaps some individual blades um, coming off of the edges there. Yeah, and that's the amazing thing about using a microscope. Depending on the view that we're looking at and the very specific little angle, it looks like we can be looking at 10 different things. 10 different parts of one sample might look like 10 different things. So you really do have to move around a bit to find the precise spot you wanna look at. And even as we move around, you can see more and more different views. Pretty cool. Okay, let's move to our next. Now this one, I have to warn you, for those of us that don't like to see clusters of things together, we are about to see a cluster of stuff together. So if it makes you queasy, you're not alone, makes me a little queasy too, but we are about to see something like that. All right. Again, I've got to see through two different phones here. There's my sample. Okay. All right. And again, I'm going to adjust my stage up and down so I can get the perfect focus for you all. So let's see if I can look on the camera here. It's gonna have a bit of a delay, but I think we'll get there. Now the trick to adjusting your stage, you wanna make sure that you're moving incrementally you wanna make sure that if you're using these wing nuts, that you're turning them in the same direction. If you're not, your stage is gonna end up crooked like this. And I speak from experience, I got a little crooked there. So that's why our angle wasn't, wasn't perfectly flat. Let's keep going there. All right, right about there, I think I'll leave it. This one's a little bit fuzzier than the last. Oh, there we go. A little bit fuzzier than the last. Okay. What the heck are we looking at here, folks? This one's kind of icky looking, isn't it? Um, so I'll give you a clue um, before, we, before we dive into revealing exactly what this sample is. And this sample uh, used to contain, used to contain yellow petals little yellow petals. This originates from, as I just gave away there, a plant, but not just any kind of plant, a pretty common weed actually. Um, sometimes we like these in our yards if, if we're supporting a pollinator garden, for example, but often we don't like these in our yards. 
So go ahead and, and think a little bit about where, where on a plant might a shape like this be? And I'll give you a few moments there uh, to think about what the heck we're looking at. It is such a funky shape. And I'm gonna try adjusting our light source to see if we can get a different angle on this. That angle kind of looks a little bit bumpy, doesn't it? There's a side view. And I think what's so fantastic about playing with uh, the light source is you can see just how subtle movements affect, again, what the specimen looks like. So from the side, it looks like one thing. From below, it looks like something else. It's pretty fascinating. So I'm loving that you folks are loving this. And it looks like we have an accurate guess. It is indeed a dandelion. But where on the dandelion do you think that it is? I bet you folks know. I want you to tell me, though. I won't give it away just yet. So where on the dandelion might we expect all of these little holes? Here, we're, we're zoomed in really, really closely. It almost looks like hair, right? Um, but actually, uh, there's a very special part of the dandelion plant where we might expect to see all of these little holes. And before you tell me that, I'm actually going to switch to our final sample because it's a little bit related uh, to what we're looking at here. Ah, it's so cool looking. I'm so pleased we can see this together. Okay. So remember, I just said that our next sample is going to have to do with our previous sample. Alrighty, and it's going to give away that question about where those holes might come from. All right, we're setting up our final sample here. Now this one's got a big slide, so I'm going to have to adjust it quickly. So stay with me. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let me try adjusting my light once more. Try that. Okay. So this case, you can see I have kind of a thin sample here, and it looks like I can see the individual light bulbs almost on that LED um, flashlight beneath. So that makes it kind of tricky to focus. But we will do our best. Hmm. Let's switch to another angle. I don't like that one. And that's really the joy of playing around with the microscope is we have infinite possibilities. Here's a few, it looks like we have a cluster here. All right. Again, I'm gonna try and play with that lighting so you folks at home can see it a little bit more clearly. And I think that actually is quite a good angle. So I'll try and stay nice and steady for you. I'm holding the flashlight there. Head post gentle breeze top of the stem. Yes, we have a bunch of guesses coming in. Absolutely, our previous sample was the very top of the dandelion, the dandelion puff ball. And that's what this sample actually looked like. So I've glued it here. I've made my own homemade microscope slide. Um, you can tell how nerdy I am, can't you? Uh, that's okay, You're all, all the nerds are welcome at the Franklin Institute, come and talk to me about it. Uh, this is actually that dandelion head uh, that we were just looking at. And indeed, all of those individual uh, looked like little, um, little puckered bits, didn't it? That's where uh, the puffball uh, stems actually stick into. And we can see one of those, um, one of those puffball stems here. And what that is actually called, those little wispy bits, it's actually called the papus or papi um, in plural. And all of those little hairs, of course, help disperse the seed. And somebody accurate, yeah, another person has, rec has suggested dandelion seeds at the top. Excellent guesses, everybody. It's spot on. And someone here has said uh, the head of the dandelion post a gentle breeze. Now it's actually these papi, these little wispy hairs that allow seed dispersal to happen. And it is reliant upon the breeze. This is an amazing evolutionary advantage. And it's one of the reasons that the dandelion weed is so successful at dispersing to great distances because the seed is carried for free, essentially. The dandelion doesn't need to expend any energy. It doesn't need to rely on any animals. It doesn't need to rely on humans for planting it. Its seeds are just dispersed on the wind. And we're gonna zoom in now to the opposite end 
uh, to actually check out what that seed looks like. So uh, this is the outside of that puffball. You can see those wispy bits. Now let's see if we can zoom in, follow its stem down to see where the seed is itself. So I'll adjust my audio cable there. I think I'm rubbing, maybe not. Still figuring it out here, folks. There we go, stick with me. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we saw those wispy bits and now we can follow those stems, just like a sleuth all the way down here. Okay, now I'm gonna try and adjust my light source. Well, that, that didn't do, did it? Let's try there. Okay, I kind of like that on the edge there. Now you're noticing a couple things in this image. And the first thing I think that's kind of distracting, isn't it, is that clear bit on the back of the sample. And it almost looks like spit or water. It's kind of gross. It's actually just glue. So that's not a part of um, the dandelion seed at all. It's, it's how I'm it's how I stuck the, the seed to the sample uh, slide that I'm using. So ignore that clear stuff that's in the background and look at what you see in the foreground. And I'm gonna move my light source around. And in our final closing uh, observations here, I want you to tell me what's surprising about the shape of this seed. So remember, we're on the opposite end of the dandelion seed. We saw on one end, those wispy hairs that we like to call, they make up the puff balls. Sometimes you pick them up and you blow them. And here's what's on the other end of those wispy bits. Now I'm moving the flashlight around. I'm gonna try and find the perfect angle to highlight the feature that I'm wanting you folks to see. And I think it's right there. I think it's right there. So tell me, do those seeds look smooth to you? I don't know, maybe at some resolution they do, but I think if we look in closely, we can see some really neat shapes in there. And someone has recognized, yeah, the seeds are really, really long. And that's another interesting thing about microscopy. Of course, we're getting up close. So it looks like the seeds are really big. I'm kind of cheating for, for you folks at home because I'm not telling uh, the magnification power. And part of that um, is really, really important. Whenever we, whenever we use the microscope, we want to know the image that we're looking at we want to know something called the scale of the image. So if I were to show you this, you couldn't know if, if that seed was 10 feet long or if that seed was 10 millimeters long. So that's what, why we use the scaling to say um, how big the image is. And somebody has reported it has thorns. It sort of looks like a cat tongue. It does, yes. If anybody out there has been licked by a cat before, sweet kisses from a cat, sometimes it feels mm, kind of rough, doesn't it? It's not smooth like a dog's tongue for all my dog people out there. Um, it is kind of rough, isn't it? And that's similar to the, to the shape of our seed here. It has little thorns almost. Somebody says it looks like a caterpillar. I agree, it does almost look like a caterpillar. It's kind of long and it has, again, those thorny edges and some caterpillars do have that for a defense mechanism. But actually what these are called in closing here are barbs. Now barbs are really common features on a lot of weeds actually. And sometimes you'll go hiking. If you've ever been uh, hiking in the woods, certainly in the mid Atlantic and around Philadelphia, you may have emerged with little tiny kind of prickers, prickly balls that stick to your, to your pants, right? And sometimes they can scratch us, but most of the time they're just a nuisance. That barb feature is the same type of feature that we're looking at here at the seed of the dandelion. And those barbs help the seed snatch onto um, uh, passing materials and it helps that seed um, then find an area to uh, grow in. So of course you want an evolutionary mechanism that can disperse your seeds, blow your seeds to a new location to grow. You also want to make sure that you can get that seed down and into the ground to begin growing and that's what the barb is for. So that's what we've got prepped for you today folks and I'm going to turn this camera off one last time. Well, actually, how about I put one uh, final beautiful image? We already saw this one, but we'll leave this up for our closing remarks just because it's so darn gorgeous. And again, I could look at this all afternoon and I hope you could too. 
So if you enjoyed what we talked about here today, let us know. We'd love to continue doing these types of engaging uh, question and answer sessions with you folks at home. And indeed, we've gone much, much longer than I even anticipated. So short and sweet, I sort of lied, um, but that's okay. I'm here for all of you folks um, at home. So if you like this imagery, again, let us know. Check out our Instagram page beginning sometime very, very soon. Uh, we'll start posting photos using my at-home microscope. We'd love to hear what you think it is that we're looking at. And if there's something at home or in your local uh, outside environment that you want to see under the microscope, also let us know. Is it maybe coffee beans? Is it dog hair? Perhaps it's more plant leaves, which I would be okay with. So we'll leave it there today, folks. Thank you so much again for joining us. Remember, as you're taking those outside photos, hashtag Franklin outside, and you can follow us at the Franklin Institute Facebook and Instagram pages. And we'll see you next week on Franklin Outside. Thank you.